Hi folks. I'm going to take you through one of the more difficult handouts that students have to complete in the course of this of this school year and it's the one about the monetary equation of exchange. I'm going to guide you through this one. Uh, what I would recommend that you do is uh, use this in class. Pause it every once in a while. Perhaps work with a partner as you're doing it. Try to answer the questions. Um, and then if you have difficulty, sort of uh, unclick the pause button and then and see what my sample answer is. Um, the monetary equation of exchange is actually a fairly simple equation uh, developed by uh, an economist by the name of Irving Fisher uh, about 60 or 70 years ago. And uh, put simply, it, it, it's simply MV equals PQ, where M is the amount of money in circulation, which is the money supply, whether it be defined as M1, M2, or M3. And in fact, we could use the monetary equation of exchange to analyze each individual aspect of the money supply, which we're going to do in this handout. V is the velocity of money and uh, what I want you to think about there is that that's how fast money is traveling through the national economy. Kind of like almost um, how quickly uh, blood is circulating through the body and the pressure at which blood circulates through the body. We can measure that in blood pressure. So then would be V, uh, the, the speed at which uh, money is circulating through the economy. That's the velocity of money. So we've got the supply of money multiplied by the velocity of money equals PQ, whereas P is the price level measured by a, a price index, and Q is real GDP. So the idea here, I guess a complicated one, although simply stated, uh, is that V is and has been typically seen as relatively constant and static. Unless there's a massive change in the national economy, the velocity of money uh, from time to time, from year to year, stays more or less constant. So too does uh, Q in this particular case, or real GDP. In other words, that there will be a particular uh, number, there will be a particular output level when it's measured at the end of the year. So that really means, and, and this is the, the, I guess, the genius idea behind the monetary equation of exchange, is that the amount of money in circulation directly affects the price level. So as M increases, so too does P, or the price level. As M decreases, so too does P, which again is, is the price level. And I think for most students, until you sort of wrestle with that and think about it and contemplate it, um, initially that might be a, a sort of a difficult equation to swallow. It's one of those things, honestly, guys, that's so simple it, it's, it's difficult. This handout is designed to kind of take you through um, so through that, have you contemplated a little bit, um, digested a little, and then hopefully come, come out with a, a little bit better understanding? I will say this before we get into it. It is very, very unlikely that you will get a question um, specifically dedicated to the monetary exchange, uh, equation of exchange. But again, you never know. It's one of those things, though, that if we're going to prepare you really well uh, to... to, to um, uh, perform at that five level or four level on the AP examination, we really need to go through this. So without further ado, so the first question really, that should be a simple one. I'm not going to give you an answer for that one. That is defined in your own words with a sentence or two, um, what the, the, the each of the four variables that are involved with the monetary equation of exchange are. So the next couple questions, though, I probably will give you an answer to. Um, so the question two is is about the you know the product of velocity and the money supply equals PQ. How could we define PQ? Um, if P is the price level and Q is real GDP, then PQ must be 
nominal GDP. So that's when we would be taking real GDP and we would be multiplying it by the price index to get our nominal measurement. So that's what PQ is. Uh, question three then is, you know, if we suppose velocity remains constant and the money supply increases, we need to explain how this would affect nominal GDP. And the answer here is, again, nominal GDP would, would of course, uh, increase if the economy isn't at full employment. Um, both P and Q could increase, but if the, if the economy is, is right at full employment, if we're on that vertical part of the LRAS curve, then, then only the price level would increase. And we've talked about this in class. Um, that, an increase in aggregate demand at that particular um, level of full employment, g real GDP, could lead to a lot of inflation. Question four, during the past 30 years, the use of credit cards has increased and banks and financial institutions have, have increasingly used computers for their transactions. And we need to explain how this might affect uh, the, the <coughs> velocity. And uh, in this particular case, um, the velocity over the past 30 years has, has increased. From year to year, we don't see a massive increase in V. Again, we assume that it's more or less constant. But if we take a look at the trend in velocity over the last 30 years in developed economies, then uh, we see that V has, has, de has increased uh, due to actually these two factors, the increased use of credit cards and the um, increasingly widespread use of computers and computer um, banking to, to be able to conduct transaction transactions, if you will, um, you know, you're, it's easier to make your money kind of work harder, if that kind of makes sense. The next question is, as a result of legislative and regulatory reforms in the 80s and 90s, banks and other financial institutions began, playing, uh, began paying interest or a uh, significant proportion of uh, the checkable deposits in the M1 definition of the money supply. So in other words, like um, banks started to offer interest on their checking accounts. That's basically what that's saying. Um, explain how these changes might be expected to affect the velocity of money. Um, and uh, in this case, V would actually decrease. And if you're wondering why that would be, um, if, if a bank is, is going to offer us interest on the balance that we maintain in our checking account, then it benefits us to, uh, to save rather than spend. And if we save more money, then V slows down. Part B. Now, part B is really just, uh, hopefully you're going to do this with a partner. In fact, I would strongly encourage that you do it with a partner. Is, is We're just deconstructing uh, M times V equals P times Q. And then over here to help you figure out some of these algebraically, really, I've given you the, um, the the PQ measurement. So uh, if we want to find P here for 1989, uh, the only thing that we need to do then is is to uh, you know d divide the PQ by Q, and then we'll get P. So all this is 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 to give you guys a little bit of practice into just kind of tinkering around with some of the variables in the monetary equation of exchange when we assume. Uh, the M1 money supply. And then if we toggle down here to the next chart, that's asking you to do essentially the same thing, only we're going to be taking a look at the M2 version of the money supply, the broader version of the money supply. So that should be fairly straightforward. Again, that's just sort of mathematics. I'd strongly encourage you guys to do that in, in small groups and then larger groups to make sure you get the right answer. But really, that's just giving you uh, some, some practice with, with playing around with the variables that are part of the money supply. So now we're going to toggle down to uh, question seven. And that one's about, you know, what, what might we infer from the changes in the 1980s and 1990s about the classical assumption uh, that uh, institutional factors determine the, the money supply. Um, we would say then that the classicals might be a little bit uh, off base uh, because um, V doesn't appear to remain constant. 
uh, when the institutional factors um, in, in, uh, change, like the increase of um, credit cards and the increase in uh, computer banking. Uh, in fact, uh, the V seems to be increasing. So it's evidence that the Glasgow's might be a little bit uh, off base there in terms of holding, holding V constant. Uh, H again should be easy if you if you're working with a, a partner, um, and again that's just graphing uh, what what it is that we see with respect to M1 and M2. So you should get a nice sort of M1 graph kind of up here in this quadrant where my cursor is moving, and you should get sort of a gradually, gradually, very gradually upsloping sort of uh, M2 curve here where my cursor is moving as well. And then uh, question A here just say, says like okay, so what trends do you see? Um, you know the trends here is uh, hopefully that you see is the velocity of money is slowly increasing and then um, you know what's the difference between the value of M1 uh, velocity and M2 velocity and can you explain why they're different um, again you know M1 is the velocity is is way 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 larger than than M2 uh, M1 is used for all kinds of transactions I mean it's the coin and the currency that's in circulation so um, M2 is more sort of, uh, when we add in those components of M2, that's more sort of savings and, and we're less likely to spend that, so the velocity is not going to be as great. Um, the last question, again, I think it's fallen off my, my video here. You can just see the very, be, uh, the very beginnings of the question. Uh, you know, for the given money supply growth, um, you know, do we see an increase or a decrease in velocity? And, and then will that increase or in decrease inflationary uh, pressures? And the answer here then, um, for the given money supply, the increase in velocity will increase inflationary pressures. So if you're struggling with that, with that handout, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that this, this quick little video guiding you through that process um, has helped. Uh, if you have further questions about the monetary equation of exchange, um, you know, give me an email. It's not super, super, super critical that you understand all the implications about this. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's it's important to pause and to spend either a half a, a class period or a full class period going through the monetary equation of exchange. All right, guys. I'll see you soon.